Hi everyone. In today's educational video, we're going to be hoping to create for you a structured approach to hyponatremia. This is a common problem in critically ill patients or any kind of hospitalized patient. In this video, we're going to show you how to approach a patient who has hyponatremia and although we won't be going into tremendous detail of particulars, we will help you uh, focus your energies on how to think about a patient with this problem. In this slide right here, you'll see an overall structured approach to a patient with hyponatremia. The first thing that you need to do when you have a patient with hyponatremia is to check their serum osmolality. And the easiest way to think about that is a measure of how concentrated the serum is. Most patients will have a low serum osmolality, as measured by the test, and it will be less than 280. So that's true hypotonic hyponatremia. There are examples, as you can see over here, where patients can have a normal serum osmolality, and we describe that as isotonic hyponatremia. And examples of the etiology of that include hyperproteinemia and hyperlipidemia syndromes. There are rare examples where patients can have hypertonic hyponatremia. These can be caused by hyperglycemia, it's factitious, mannitol, sorbitol, and other similar agents. But the preponderance of patients who have true hyponatremia have true hypotonic hyponatremia. Once you've done the initial determination of which category of hyponatremia the patient has, then you need to make a clinical determination of their volume status. As you can see here, the patients can fall into three categories, hypovolemic, euvolemic, and hypervolemic. Many patients that you will run into will have this classic category of euvolemic hypotonic hyponatremia. And these are some of the most important clinical entities that you can manage, including the syndrome of inappropriate antidiuretic hormone syndrome, um, hypothyroidism, and issues such as adrenal insufficiency. They mention here beer potomania and psychogenic polydipsia. But as you'll see in one of the other slides, there are some ways that you can help ferret out exactly which is going on. In hypovolemic hyponatremia, the patient has lost both salt and water and has lost more salt than water. And it's important at that point to check a urine sodium to see if it's low or high to, uh, uh, to help determine whether it's extra renal sodium losses or renal sodium losses. And you can see some examples uh, listed here. Patients who have hypervolemic hyponatremia usually have edematous states. In general, there's problems with delivering the water to the kidneys and have it being excreted properly. Um, examples include congestive heart failure, cirrhosis, uh, and advanced kidney disease, and nephrotic syndrome. One of the important points is that the treatment, at least the initial treatment, for these two categories of euvolemic and hypervolemic hyponatremia is fluid restriction, water restriction. This can often be very complex in the critically ill patient who may be somewhat hypotensive, and that's where it's important for you to make your clinical determination working with your team as to whether they're really in this category of hypovolemic hyponatremia because the treatment there is to begin by correcting the volume status and getting the patient into the euvolemic state. As many of you know, there are new categories of agents which are rarely used, uh, certainly in the ICU setting, uh, because they can cause some challenges clinically, uh, of the VAPTANs that can be used in the hypervolemic, hypotonic, hyponatremic patient to actually cause an aquaresis. We wanted to put a couple more slides just to reinforce this reasonable, structured approach to the patient with hyponatremia. Again, start out by checking the serum osmolality, determining if it's low, normal, or high, and you can see the associated differential diagnoses. Most of the patients you'll be treating will have true hyposmolal or hypotonic hyponatremia. Then making a clinical determination as to whether they're hypovolemic, isovolemic, 
or hypervolemic hyponatremia, and then checking urine electrolytes here to determine if it's extra renal or renal losses, here in isovolemic hyposmotic hyponatremia to determine if it's water intoxication or these classic other ones such as SIDH, hypothyroidism, and adrenal insufficiency, and again here using the urine sodium to determine if it's acute renal failure, chronic renal failure, if there's an elevated urine sodium, or if there's a low urine sodium, the other etiologies such as cirrhosis and congestive heart failure. Again, just to nail the point home, this is another slide showing a very similar approach. Start by checking serum osmolality. If it's low, as it is most of the time, check your extracellular fluid volume state. One of the things that's different about uh, some of these other slides is focusing in, and I, we have left this off on purpose, is focusing in on the urine osmolality. In general, if the patient has a low urine osmolality, in this category, the concern is that it's water intoxication. And if it's a elevated urine osmolality, the patient's urine is more concentrated than it should be, and that helps you think about things like classically SIDH, but otherwise, uh, in addition, hypothyroidism, adrenal insufficiency. And again, although it is clinically relevant to use urinosms, serum lights, uh, serumosms, urine lights, and osms, the focus often is for you to make an assessment of their clinical volume status. Because if you believe that their clinical volume status is low, that patient needs to be resuscitated first. And that's an important point. Once they become resuscitated and either have isovolemic or if you believe the patient has hypervolemic hyponatremia, your first step is fluid restriction. One of the interesting points that's come up now, especially if one cares a lot for patients with neurosurgical or neurological problems, is what is the role of hypertonic saline in these patients? And in these patients, fluid restriction is often the wrong answer. And although it's not classically taught for medicine patients who have hyponatremia, there is a much lower threshold to start either salt tablets or hypertonic saline to prevent uh, hyponatremia from occurring in these patients because of all the associated uh, concerns for having hyponatremia in the neuro patient and to, to prevent it and to treat it once it happens. And so again, there's a classic approach to hyponatremia that we've shared with you in these slides. But some of the things that have changed over time are the treatments, which include, other than fluid restriction, the VAPTANs in patients that have hypervolemic hyponatremia to cause an aquaresis, and using hypertonic saline for patients who may either have SIDH or cerebral salt wasting if they have a primary neurological diagnosis and you don't want to wait for the effect of uh, fluid restriction. So again, I'd like to end by leaving you with this slide and showing you that there really is a reasonable structured approach to help you think about patients that have hyponatremia. Start by checking their serum osmolality, determining if it's low, normal, or high. Most of the time, it will be true hyposmolal hyponatremia. Then determine their volume status using your clinical judgment to help categorize into the three major categories of hypovolemic, euvolemic, and hypervolemic hyponatremia. Thanks again for watching.